let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll dive in. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given to us. And Lord, we just want to pause and just say, Lord, truly, uh, we are a needy people. Lord, we can do nothing. We can do nothing. We can't accomplish anything. Lord, without you. And so, Lord, we just truly acknowledge that, Lord, you are the author. You are the sustainer, Lord, of our life. You're the author and finisher of our faith. And Lord, we truly look to you today. And Lord, I just pray with all my heart that eyes would be open, that Lord, as the psalmist said, that we behold wondrous things from your word. And Lord, I just truly pray that you'd give me the ability to teach your word, Lord, in your power, or with your ability, and that Lord, we could truly uh, be enriched, Lord, because of uh, this study, and also because of, Lord, just the techniques <coughs> of hermeneutics on how to truly properly Lord, interpret the Bible correctly and, Lord, truly get the, the meaning that you have for us so that we can honor you, we can glorify you, Lord, with our lives. Lord, I just pray with all my heart, if there's anyone here that's lost, that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that they would turn from their sin and that you would, Lord, convict them that, Lord, they are a sinner and that they have sinned against you, Lord, a holy and righteous God, and that, Lord, they would truly believe that Jesus did go to the cross and take their sin and the world's sin and that, Lord, he died and was punished in their place so that we wouldn't have to go to hell, that we could have heaven and have our sins forgiven and that you give them the faith to believe that you died and were buried and that you give them the faith to believe, Lord, that you were raised from the dead and that you would give them the heart to truly call upon your name. And you tell us in your word, Lord, all those that truly call upon your name uh, with repentance and faith in you shall be saved. So, Lord, we just rejoice in the fact that you are the one who gives eternal life, who wants to give eternal life to all. And, Lord, we just praise you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for all your provisions, Lord, for us. Lord, I lift up Ray to you. We just pray for his salvation. And, Lord, we just truly pray that you'd open up his heart, you'd open up his mind to receive your word, to understand your word, Lord. And that, Lord, you would work in his heart and grant him repentance and salvation. And, Lord, I know that... Even Carl, my father-in-law, Lord, truly needs to be uh, saved. And so we lift him up to you, Lord, as well. And just ask that you move in his heart and life. And that you would water the word that's there. If there's any truth in cold storage, I pray that you thaw that out by the power of your spirit. And, Lord, drive it deep into his heart. Lord, in every person that has relatives that are lost in this building today, we pray for their salvation. And that, Lord, you would move in their lives. And, Lord, move in our lives also to give us those opportunities to be that witness or to be able to share your truth with them, or because it's your truth and your truth alone that's going to get into their heart. Nothing else will. And so, Lord, we ask uh, these things. I rejoice with the prayer requests, Lord, that we've heard, the praises that we've heard as well, Lord. We just pray that you'll continue to strengthen each and every one of us. Lord, we just pray that you'll grant and answer each and every one of our private petitions, Lord, according to your will. And Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, if you have your... Your paper there, uh, we were moving along and we got to the place where uh, we talked about key words to know, and I'll not go through all of those, but just as a refresher, uh, the two biggest ones that we want to look at is inductive, that word inductive there, it's under uh, session one, step one, key words to know. Uh, inductive Bible study, letting the passage speak for itself, and that's what we want to be about when you study the Bible. Or just personally, you want to be an inductive student, where you come to the Bible and let it truly speak for itself. And, uh, and we'll look at different examples of how people get in trouble and not interpret the Bible correctly when you do come to the Word of God with your own preconceived 21st century ideas. And uh, we'll look at that. And then we also uh, looked at the word deductive, and that's approaching the passage with those preconceived ideas or coming to the text with what you think the Word of God says rather than letting the text speak for itself. And then um, you look down there at the word exegesis. It's the same thing as saying inductive, to find the original intended meaning of God in the text to the ones that the scripture was written to. So you always want to go to a church and you want to be a student that's exegetical. You want to go to a church where they preach the Bible, you know, verse by verse. Like you heard Brother John preaching on Sunday morning and you'll notice that all of his points came from that text. He wasn't all over the Bible. You know, you can quote other scripture to support the text that you're preaching from, but all your points come from that text, and that we are looking at whatever passage that is. So that's exegesis. And then you have eisegesis. That's coming to the text of scripture with your own ideas. So that's the same thing as saying inductive and deductive. It's just a different way of saying it. And you remember that hermeneutics is the science or the principle 
an art or task by which the meaning of the biblical text is determined, the rules of interpreting scripture. And then we talked a little bit about allegorizing the text, searching for hidden secret meanings in the text, uh, when you know the meaning might be more obvious. And sometimes when the Bible is silent, the preacher needs to be silent. Amen? Or if he does want to give an opinion on something, he needs to make sure that people understand that this is my opinion, this is not thus saith the Lord, or the scripture. So we've got to be very clear about that as well. And then we got into the Bible is a human book. You know, each letter, word, sentence, and book is uh, recorded in the Word of God. Now when you look at Psalm 119, you do a personal study, you'll look at every one of the sections in Psalm 19, it all starts with the Hebrew, each, each one of the sections starts with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Very interesting. And you know, you've heard that not one word, uh, not one jot or tittle pass away from the, from the law. Well, when you look on the the Hebrew letter, there's like little teeny little like little little like edges of it, and he's referring to those things. And I'll, I'll show you a slide later on about just that little part of the letter, uh, what he was talking about. Very little like if you had if you were to draw the letter L, let's say, and you were to draw the L, and let's say right here when you're coming down, you just made a little mark to the left, just a little tiny mark to the left, and then you went back to the right to finish your L. Well, that little teeny tiny mark is one of those things that he's referencing. So not even the smallest part of the letter will pass away before all is fulfilled. So not only is the word itself inspired, but each letter was inspired by God himself. Amen? Yes, indeed. And so we looked at the fact, though, that God did use human authors. The Bible was written on two different continents by 40 different authors in a span of around 15 to 1,800 uh, years apart. Some say a little bit longer than that. But if you look at, you know, 40 different authors who most of them never saw each other, they lived in different time frames where, you know, each one would die, so they, there was no way that they could meet one another, and yet the Bible is perfectly put together and doesn't contradict itself. You know, God wrote this book, amen? How would Job know that God hangs the earth on nothing? They didn't have satellites and rockets, and they didn't have cell phones or batteries back then, amen? Boy, and so it definitely is. Uh, a divine book. And then we looked at, um, you know, how, uh, an example, like horse of a different color, the different unique languages or expressions or figures of speech. You know, we got to understand the different idioms in different cultures. And if I say a horse of a different color in this country, you get what I'm saying. But if I were to say that into a different country, they would say, well, what color are you talking about? You're right. Horses do have different colors. They would take it more literally rather than an idiom. So these are things that we have to look at, but it also shows us that God did use the culture and the people of that culture uh, in a human way to also uh, put in the Bible as well. Uh, and then if you'll continue down where it says like letter E there, it says each biblical writing took on the nature of a specific literary form. And then letter F says, you know, each biblical writing was understood by its initial reader in accords with the basic principles of logic and communication. So when you look at God's Word, it's made up of different what? Like the English version, the way our Bible is put together is not in biblical order. Do you know that? It's put together in, in sections. Wisdom, and epistles, and history, and all of, those, all of those are put together in sections. Now if you were to get the Jewish version... In order of the Bible, then you can read it in its historical order and the way that it was put together. But our, our version was put together in different sections, wisdom literature and epistles and the history and so on. And so, but you have to understand that when you do interpret the Bible, is this a history book? Is this an epistle? Is this wisdom? Is this a poem? Is this a psalm? Those kind of things you have to know to be able to, to, to properly interpret the Bible as well. Yes, ma'am. Letter D. Did I miss it or did you not cover it? Letter D. Uh, each biblical writing was accepted and understood in the light of its context. Context. Okay. Like, like for example there, uh, Laodicea, I'll spew you out of your mouth. Now the Laodiceans knew what was meant by this. You know, it's kind of interesting that the Word of God does say that he will spew you out of his mouth. Interesting statement that the Lord would make, would it, would it not? So what does that mean? How do you figure out? Where do, where do you start? Well, you got to go back into their culture. you got to go back into what was going on in their town. What was their town known for? And why would the people of that day and age understand what was 
being said by that. Well, as you, you look at the geographical area as well, you know, that also gives us clues to what may have been going on. Well, what's interesting about Laodicea, it was a triangle city or a tri-city. You had Heropolis and you had Colossae that was to the north of Laodicea. Laodicea was here. Now, Heropolis was known for its hot springs, had very hot springs, and people would come and they, they said that if you get in these waters, it has healing properties. And then Colossae had freshwater springs that were really cold. And, and people would come and they would be able to be refreshed because of the fresh water that was there and that it was cold. And so weary travelers were known to go to Colossae. Well, what the Laodiceans did, because they had no springs or water supply, they built an aqueduct from both of those springs. And when the water from Heropolis, which was hot, and Colossae, which was cold, would go down that aqueduct. By the time it got to lay to see it, guess what? Remember how, how the Lord used lukewarm? Remember that? And then when they, you, you, ever, you ever like pick up a cup of coffee and you think, man, I'm taking a drink and you forgot that it was cold? Ugh. First thing you want to do is what? Spit it out. And uh, Or the same way with, you know, cold drink and you put it in your mouth and it's warm. Well, in the same way, you know, travelers would come thinking, hey, man, I'm going to get this fresh water and they would put it in their mouth and it was tepid, is the Greek word there, and it means lukewarm, and so they would spit it out. And so they understood, based on that, but you have to know their culture, you have to know the geographical uh, surroundings and what's going on to help us find out and bridge what took place in this century to the 21st century. And that's how we also are able to interpret the Bible. And we're going to look at these different gaps all the gaps that need to be filled in in order for us to be able to truly interpret the Bible the way it needs to be. All right, and then number two, uh, the Bible is a divine book. It's a divine book. And I think we looked at 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is God breathed. And um, Peter tells us that scripture was not done or came by human will, but it was men who were moved by the Holy Spirit. And we talked about like it, the, the, the language that he's using there is of a sailboat or sailing. And the sailboat that has no motor, has no way of moving itself, what do they do? They raise the sail. And so it needs something greater than itself. It needs an outside force to act upon that sailboat in order for it to move. Well, when the wind hits those sails, it begins to push that boat. Well, in the same way, that was the in the mindset of the people of that day, they understood that. So these men were moved or controlled by the Holy Spirit the way a sailboat was driven by the wind. Well, these men were driven by the Holy Spirit for every letter of every word of every sentence that they wrote in the Bible. That's why we can say that the Bible is inerrant, that it's without error, because God doesn't make mistakes, amen? You know, just like you take a pen in your hand and you begin to write... You know, somebody could technically say, well, it's the pen that wrote that. Because it's the pen that you're using. But however, we know that there's something greater than that pen. There's an outside force that's getting a hold of that pen and controlling what that pen writes. Are you with me? Well, in the same way, God used man as his pen, if you will, and wrote exactly what he wanted in this book. Without air, without, error, without, without uh, human wisdom, any type of human will being put into it. Uh, first, or Second Peter chapter one is very crystal clear about that. That you know, it's not of any private interpretation, nor was it of the will of man, but it was men moved under the full control of God Himself when He wrote the Word of God. So it's a divine book. So because God wrote it, what does that mean? Well, letter A, the Bible being a divine book means it's what inerrant. What does inerrant mean? No errors. Why? God is immutable. Right? God is immutable. Uh, Malachi chapter 6 verse 3. I the Lord change not. I the Lord change not. Now the Bible teaches us that God is perfect. The Bible teaches us there's no unrighteousness in him at all. And that his character, his nature never changes. And that everything that he does is absolutely 100% perfect. So the Lord does not make mistakes. There's no error. The Lord doesn't contradict himself. Now, if you read in the Bible and you're confused, and it seems like there may be something that's contradictory, 
you got to stop and say, hey, look, God doesn't make mistakes. He's not confused. I am. So what's the best interpreter of Scripture? Scripture. Scripture. Amen. And context, context. When you're reading, context is always king. No matter what you do, context is king when you're reading and trying to apply the truth of God's Word to your life and interpreting it correctly. You know, Jesus said, man, I'm the same today, yesterday, and forever. He's immutable. Amen? He changes not. So, therefore, if God is perfect, that means His Holy Word also is what? Perfect. Amen? Amen. So, uh, oh, I, what's the name of that group up there in Chicago? Oh, I know, I know, I know the name of the group. It just slipped my mind. What's that? Who? The Mafia? The Mafia? Yeah. The mafia. Yeah. yeah they, well, there's that group too, man. Yes, indeed. Uh, oh, it was called, I think it was called the Jesus Seminar. And, uh, and right now, they, they get a group of people that sit around a table, and they have two different color marbles, and they go through the writings, and they go through the sayings of Jesus, and right now, they're at the point where they say that 85% of what Jesus said wasn't what Jesus said. And that Jesus didn't mean it that way. Well, what a meeting, boy. You know, and, and you know, listen, you want to go against this book? This book is against you. Amen. Why? Because God wrote this book through man. You know, like my brother told me, you know, I was one time when I was lost, I was, you know, struggling with my belief with God. And, and um, he said, you know, Dave, he said, look at look around and look at all that God has made, man, in six days. He goes, you know, it, doesn't that blow your mind? And I, at that time it did, because I loved astronomy and all that kind of stuff. And he said, well, don't you think I could write a book? He could do all that? Absolutely he could write a book. Amen? That's like, I love the, what he said to Abraham. He said, is there anything too hard or too difficult for the Lord? Man, nothing is impossible with God. Amen? Amen. So it's inerrant. It's immutable. And, uh, and that's why it's so important that when you listen to people's testimonies, you listen to what they say about God's Word. Because if they come and say to you, well, you know, I just don't think it's God's Word. Well, remember what we talked about last Wednesday? If somebody says to you, well, I just don't believe the Bible, I just don't really think it's God's Word, or I, I think maybe some of it is, but then there's a lot of it that's not. Are you dealing with the saved person or a lost person? Lost person. Why? Because, man, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. It's impossible to please God without faith. faith. Amen. You're saved by grace through faith. Faith that's based on His Word. Amen. All right. Then also, letter B. The Bible being a divine book is authoritative. Authoritative. It's the final authority on all matters. Period. Period. It's the final authority on all matters that pertain to this life and also the one to come. How do we know that? Well, what did Jesus say when he was fighting the devil in the wilderness? How did Jesus defeat the devil? He used scripture. scripture. And what did he say? What, what, what was his like? What did he reference? It is written. Now, isn't it interesting that the Lord didn't say it was written? Now, he could have said that because the Old Testament, when Jesus was on earth, was already complete. He could have said it was written. But he said what? It is. is. Why would he say that? What's that? Well, there's more to be written, yes, but what else? God's word is past, present, and future. Right. It's it's man, it's the living, active word of God. Amen. So the old testament for our lives is just as relevant as the newspaper is today and the news that it reports. But this is one hundred percent accurate. No no fake news in here, amen. <laughs> amen. Yes, indeed. So it's authoritative on all matters. And what's interesting, too, is God's Word is so thorough and so perfect, I don't care what you face, what philosophy that you hear, if you were to hear a hundred new philosophies a day, God's Word would address those philosophies in some, some shape, form, or fashion, through precept, through principle, through statute, or through commands. His Word applies to every single thing that pertains to life. Anything that confronts you, anything that you're up against, God's word will and does address it, no matter what that may be. The Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? 
And right now, we have 66 books that make up the canon called the Holy Bible that teaches us who he is and what he expects from us and how we're to live. So it's authoritative, 100%. Uh, like a church gets in trouble when, you know, they want to go with the guy that's been there a long time and he thinks he's the boss hog of the church and I'm going to have it my way and I want people to come to me and, you know, I don't want the responsibility the pastor has, but I just want people to come to me so I can influence them, you know. Oh, I run into all kinds of boss hogs in churches. And, uh, and they think it's a power thing, you know. Man, that's the last thing you should ever do is go into any type of ministry thinking that man, you have some type of power or position, because you don't. You know, Jesus was a servant leader, amen? Boy, what did John the Baptist say? Did he say, I must decrease, or who, who, who must increase? Decrease, amen? Yeah, so the way up is what? Down. If you want to be the ruler of all, you've got to be the servant of all. Amen? Absolutely. All right, and then um, letter C there says, The Bible being a divine book has unity. Has unity. It does not contradict itself. Why? Well, the Word of God tells us in Titus, chapter, I believe, number one, that it's impossible for God to lie. Boy, impossible. Think about that for a second. Impossible for God to lie. Do you realize that it's also impossible for God to be tempted to sin? It's impossible for God to even be tempted to sin. Wow. And we praise God for that. Amen? All right, letter D. The Bible being a divine book has mysteries. Some explain, some not. For example, I put there Isaiah 55. You know, my ways are higher than... And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Amen? So if somebody comes to you and says they've got the whole Bible figured out, boy, that's a red flag right there. Amen? To say you got the whole Bible figured out is to say that you got God figured out. And what does the Bible say about God's nature? Can you, can you totally 100% know everything there is to know about God? No. And the Bible says his ways are past finding out. Amen? And he says, man, there's pleasure in my right hand forevermore. So there's a lot of things about the Lord that, you know, as much as we would want to know, and we can know, and he lets us know what's important about himself, but, man, there's a part of God that we'll never be able to figure out or explain. And I'm glad because I wouldn't want to serve a God that I could explain in my little, you know, probably, probably half a pound brain. <laughs> Amen? Yes, indeed. Also, um... I want you to go in your Bibles to uh, go over in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians real quick. 1 Corinthians. I want to show you something. 1 Corinthians. Now, it's a divine book. So always keep that in mind. When you come to it, yes, it's a human book. It was written by humans. God used geographical. He used grammatical. He used all kinds of things humanly to put the Bible together. However, it's also a divine book. That's key. And you remember when we first started this, when you teach somebody, whether you're on your porch, sitting in your living room, sitting behind a podium, wherever it may be, you know, you're teaching for transformation. You're asking God to take the truth of his word and transform their life by it. Drawing them closer to the Lord, uh, bringing conviction to their heart, their loss, so they could be saved, or to encourage their heart, to set them in a different direction, that maybe they're going on a path that's not so good. But then we always teach for change, not just to give people a bunch of facts about God's Word or interesting things about His Word. We're teaching for change, and it's got to come from the heart. So, when it comes to being a divine book, look at verse 18 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Notice what it says now. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, those that are going to hell, those that are lost, foolishness. But unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God. What's the power of God? Man, the preaching of what? His, his word. Isn't that interesting? Look at verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And then verse 20, the Lord says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world look at verse 21 for after that in the wisdom of god the world by wisdom knew not god so in other words what he's saying is 
that you cannot know God based on the philosophies and the wisdom of man. You're not. It's not going to happen. They they sound good. It may uh, preach good, but man, God saying it's garbage. Period. You cannot know God from human wisdom. Period. God wisdom does not come from man. It comes from Himself, and we'll see that as we move through this. Look at verse uh, twenty-one. It says, "For after that, in the wisdom of God." The world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God. Listen to this. Isn't this interesting? It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So God says that what we do Sunday after Sunday, when a man gets behind a pulpit and preaches his book, God says it's foolishness. But that's the very thing that he used to save people and to draw people to himself. Isn't that interesting? Why? Because it's a divine book. Right? Most people would say, well, man, I, hey, brother, I need you to put some dead body up here, put him in a casket, and I want to see that guy raised from the dead before I believe. And people want proof, and people want signs, and people want all these things. And remember the rich man in hell? Remember how he said, hey, Father Abraham, I pray that you'll send me back that I can warn my five brothers? And what did, what, what did God tell him? What's that? Yeah, hey, they have the prophets and Moses. In other words, hey, they have the word of God yeah. preached to them. So God uses his what? His word. Amen? Boy. Now, notice what it says in verse 22. It says, for the Jews require a sign. Isn't that interesting? Boy, they want a sign. Boy, they were all about wanting to see signs and miracles. But did they believe even though they saw some of those signs and miracles? No. They didn't. In fact, he said, hey, listen, if... If, if the signs that had been performed back in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. And I am the living word standing before you doing these things, and yet you still don't believe. So signs and wonders is not what's going to get into somebody's heart to save them. It is God's holy word. You know, I like to think of people like, like a rhinoceros. Boy, you see that hard outer shell? Well, a lot of hearts are just like that hard outer shell. My words, my illustrations, my application are, is not going to penetrate that hard shell. We need armor-piercing bullets, if you will. Spiritually armor-piercing bullets. And that is what? The Word of God. That's the only thing that's going to crack that shell and get into that heart. You know, if somebody's blind... Does it matter how bright the candle or how bright the light is? Are they going to be able to see it? No. Why? Because this book is a divine book. And you will never understand this book on human wisdom alone. Period. God's very crystal clear about that. And we're going to see that as we move through this. Look at verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified and unto the Jew a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks foolishness. So let me ask you a question. Why is it a stumbling block to a Jew when it says right here in verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. So why is it a stumbling block to the Jews? Christ is the Messiah or the Savior, right? Why is it they have a why is it they have such a hard time with that? They were looking for a savior to bring them out of their bondage under the, the Roman crush the Roman authority and set up the kingdom. You see they, they saw the they saw the first coming and the second coming as one event. They didn't see it as two separate events. That was a mystery that God had hidden. But also, the Bible says in Galatians, cursed is the man or the one that hangs on a tree. Says that in the Old Testament too. Cursed is the man that hangs on a tree. They're cursed of God. How can this guy who's hanging on a tree be my Savior, be my Messiah? Not realizing that he was taking the curse for us. That he was dying in the place of the sinner. That's why the Bible says he bore our sin in his body. So, hey, he took off the black jacket of sin of our life, wrapped that around himself, and literally died in our place as the sinner, even though he himself remained sinless. So he became a curse for us. And to the Greeks, it's foolishness. You know, when you think about the resurrection, you know, like, for example, in India, uh, Chuck Colson was over there preaching, and he says, you know, I noticed everywhere I went that if I talked about Christ in generalities, they really tuned in and they really listened, but when I got to the resurrection, boy, that's when they kind of just cut me off. 
and got stoic. See, there's a lot of people that, you know, the resurrection is, boy, that, that's, a, that's a, it's a, it's a confrontation. It's something that's in their face. Because Christ is the only one that was raised from the dead, never to die again. If you look at Buddha and every other false god or false idol that's out there, none of them have a resurrection story. Boy, and when you preach the resurrection, that means you also have to preach on, hey, there's a judgment day. You're going to stand before God one day to give an account of every single thing you've ever done. Uh, if you're lost, and as a saved person, you're going to give an account of the things that you did in your body, as the Bible says. From the time you got saved to the day that you died, you're going to give an account of the service that you've given to the Lord. A lot of people don't like to hear that. They don't want to hear about judgment. They want their life. They want to live the life the way they want to. Why? Because they're dead in their trespasses and sin. Yes, ma'am. Would one of those examples be that they believe in reincarnation, so why would they have to believe in the resurrection? Because we would always be, you know, right. always be coming back. Well, in one sense of the word, they far as the resurrection from the dead, like bodily, you know, but to transform into something else like if you, if you did all right well then you might come back as a, a cow a lot of them believe that you know hey that's my uncle that's my relative you know so uh that's okay because it doesn't confront their sin it doesn't confront their life it doesn't confront how they're living their life because they have to stand before god you know like an atheist what is the problem is it a head problem or is it a heart problem it's a what it's a heart problem Right? Because if I were to honestly say, hey, you, that picture right there that's hanging on the wall, hey, there was a wood factory, it's hanging by a metal wire in the back of that, there was a metal factory and a, and a paint factory, and if they all blew up, and all that paint came into that back door and took a right turn and put itself up on the wall, you'd say, Brother Dave, you, you, brother, you lost your mind. We, we, we need to put you in a mental institution. Amen? So, I mean, so logically, we know that it was a painter and a person that put that together. Because the evidence of the painter, even though we can't see the painter, the evidence that the painter exists is because the painting is there. So if there's a building, there's a what? A builder. If there's a creation, there's a creator. Amen? And so the Bible says they suppress the truth. They're willfully ignorant, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1. Willfully ignorant. So they suppress the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. And so there's no such thing as being willfully ignorant. That basically means you reject the truth, don't want to hear the truth because you want your way, your life, and you don't want to be confronted with how you're living. Boy, yes indeed. Now here's what's interesting. If you go over to your Bible now, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. This is proof that this is a divine book. But God, in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, but God has revealed them unto us by his what? His spirit. All right, look at verse 9. It says, but as it's written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. All right, well, how are these things going to enter into our eyes and our ears and all these things? How are we going to understand God and how are we going to understand who he is? Well, look at what it says in verse 10. But God has revealed them, these things, unto us by his Holy Spirit. For the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of that man which is in him? So if I were to say to you, hey, I know you, you'd say, well, yeah, yeah, you know me, but you can't fully know me. The only person that can fully know me, Dave Unger, is Dave Unger. The spirit that is in this body is the only one that can completely, 100% understand who I am. Now, you can see who I am through my actions, through my words, and you can, you know, get a good gist of who I am, but you're not going to fully know who I am and what I'm thinking and how I feel unless you're me. Well, what does it say? Notice what it says. It says, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of that man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but what? The but the Spirit of God, who is God himself. Amen? So the only one that fully knows God is God. Right? But notice what it says. It says in verse 12, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So how do we know and begin to know God? It's given to us by what? By the Holy 
Not doesn't say anything about you in there. Doesn't say anything about worldly philosophy or anything human, does it? No, it does not. Listen to what it says. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now verse 14 is key. Listen to what it says. But the natural man, what does that mean? Carnal, the lost man, the one that doesn't have the Spirit of God, right? It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what? foolishness unto him. Neither can they know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual, in other words, who has the Holy Spirit, judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So, the Word of God clearly says that a lost person is not going to understand the Bible unless God opens up their heart and mind and grants them understanding. In Acts chapter 16, Paul went down by the river to pray. And there he met a woman named Lydia the purple seller. And as he was teaching and sharing the gospel, the Bible says this, and God opened up her mind to understand the things that Paul was teaching. So when a preacher steps in a pulpit, or when somebody steps on your porch, or you're sitting across your living room, you got to understand, hey, listen, if my relative is lost, they don't know the Lord, listen, they're not going to understand this book unless the Spirit of God opens their heart, gives them understanding. He's the only one that can. So it goes back to that blind man and putting a brighter candle. Well, that one didn't work. Let's see if he can see this one make it brighter. He's not going to see it. Why? Because he's dead spiritually. When a person's in a casket, they're dead, right? Now, can that person lie? Steal, cheat, and rob? No, because they're dead. And God says a person that's lost is dead just like that spiritually. So that's why it takes an act of God. That's why the Bible says there's no one that seeks after the Lord. No one. I will draw all men to myself. No one can come under the no one can come under the to me unless the Father what draws them, right? So that's why we say that salvation is of the Lord, not of man. Because if man was left to himself, they would go straight to hell doing whatever it was they were doing. And never really even have a thought about God. So God is at work. God is active. So anytime you have an opportunity to witness to somebody, talk about God, somebody seems interested in God, it's because God is at work in their life. Or they would not be interested in even bringing up the subject of God. So that's how you can know that, hey, man, God is in this because they're talking about God. Now, they may be hostile, they may be upset, but they're still talking about God. God is working and using that opportunity for you to give them truth, the truth. And what does the Bible say about truth? You shall know the truth and the what? Now, notice the key word there is what? You shall know. Now, if you have a headache and you don't know where the medicine is, is that going to help you? You got to know where the medicine is, and you got to know what that medicine does in order for you to properly what apply it to your life to take care of that ailment that you're, you're dealing with. Well, spiritually, the same way. All right, so remember how uh, in Kings, Second Kings chapter six, man, the army was surrounding the man Elijah, and he had his servant there, and that king was coming to take him because he was upset that God was telling Elisha all the plans of of the king and what he was doing. And so the king of Israel was usurping him and getting the advantage. Well, one of his men said, well, it's Elijah. God's speaking to him and telling him all your plans. Well, he wanted to get a hold of the man of God so that wouldn't take place anymore. So they surrounded the whole entire city and besieged it. And remember how his servant said, man, what are we going to do? Alas, my master, what are we going to do? Man, we're outgunned. We're outnumbered. Now, he had eyes to see physically, but he was seeing the problem. But what he didn't see was that God already had the solution to the problem already, already there. So one had physical eyes, but the other one had also his spiritual eyes opened by the Lord. Remember what he prayed? Lord, I pray that you open his eyes, that he may see. And then his eyes were open, and he saw all those chariots of fire and all those angels were about that were going to do battle on that day. Amen? Well, in the same way, when you... Talk to your relative, no matter where they're at, or your friend or acquaintance. Always remember, hey, Lord, I need to pray. Lord, please open their eyes. Please grant them understanding. Please, Lord, when I share your word with them, 
And I'm praying that you'll open their eyes, you'll open their understanding, Lord, help them to understand what's being said. Like when I come and preach here, I might, one of my prayers is, Lord, Lord, make the gospel crystal, crystal clear in their heart and mind. Help them to see their sin. Help them to see that righteousness comes from you. Help them to understand the judgment to come. Lord, please open their heart, open their minds. Lord, refresh your saints. Help them to see wondrous things from your word. So even as a Christian, we are taught by the Holy Spirit. So we need him in everything that we do when it comes to this book. Amen? Are you with me? All right. Um, let's see here. All right, step two, the process. All right. Step two, the process. <clears throat> the first word there is observation. Observation. All right, that's reading it. All right, so when we come to the Bible to study it, we want to observe. And when we want to put our observation hat on, if you will, reading it. What does it say? The meaning of the words, phrases, sentences, paragraphs, relationships, overall ideas and concepts. Observation. Hmm. And that's, that is something that we got to pray and say, God, Lord, help me be a person that really does observe. And help me to see what it is that you're trying to teach me. All right, and then, so observation is reading it. What does it say? Man, you're looking up, what, what does this word mean? And, you know, and, and where does this sentence end? And where does it begin? And, you know, you're looking for words like therefore. So when you read the word therefore in the Bible, what, what should that clue you into? Something happened before, right? So when you read the word therefore, hey, I got to stop and back up and see what, what took place. And as a result of what took place, therefore, he says this. Like if you look at the book of Romans, it's a, when you see how Paul wrote that, the first half of that book is man interpret, is an interpretation. This is what it means. This is what it means. This is what God means. And then the, the other half of that book is him applying it to everybody. Now, right, let me take everything that I said and let me apply it so that you can have a better understanding of it. All right? So, observation. Then you have number two, interpretation. Interpretation. Well, you can't interpret it unless you are observe it first. So interpretation. What does it mean? Using rules of interpretation. You know, you're seeking the theme. You're seeking the purpose, the intent. Uh, and then, you know, as a preacher or a teacher, then that's when you begin to get into your outline or summary of the book. Uh, inductive, never deductive. So you're coming to the text saying, God, what are you saying to these people that you wrote it to? What is the literal interpretation? And then we get into application. Never application first. Now you don't put the caboose before the engine. It's always the engine before the caboose. And that's observation, interpretation, and then application. Number three is application. How does it apply to me? You know, applying it, uh, using illustrations, life stories, uh, asking questions. Uh, and we're going to get into some of those things as well. Now, here's some steps to take before you get into a study. Like, we're doing Old Testament, New Testament Bible characters, all right? So the first thing we want to do before we get into the book, before you even open it, is pray. Lord, give me understanding about this character, this person, Matthias or Judas or whatever it is you're studying. Lord, you grant me understanding. Lord, help me to see and know what it is that you'd have for me, number one, that you will change my life with it. You'll transform my life with it. And that, Lord, I want you to be able to apply it to my life. So you're praying for guidance. The Bible is, 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 a, is a book about himself. No one knows it better than who? Yeah. He's the author of it. Amen? So where do we go to find out what he meant? We go to the author of it. If you want to know what a song means, who do you go to? The one who... The one who wrote it. That's where you go. Because if you don't go to the one who wrote it, you can come up with all kinds of meanings of what the song is, and you can be completely off after you talk to the one that wrote it. So he's the author of it, and if you're saved, the author of the Bible lives in you. Amen? 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 14. In fact, go to your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, we do, we've already read verses 12 and 14, but I want you to see something else. And I want you to see how we talked about this being a divine book and a human book. Well, it all comes together right there in chapter 2. And look at verse number 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
Notice what it says. And I love this scripture. Man, I love this scripture. It says, and brethren, when I came to you... Now, remember how Paul rebuked the Corinthians and said, some were saying, I'm a Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm a Peter. You know, they were basically getting that rock star mentality. They were enamored with the personality of the preacher. Well, man, hey, man, boy, man, you ain't never heard him preach before, man. That guy right there, you know, boy, that guy right there. Well, Paul rebuked them through the power of the Lord. Hey, look, don't ever get enamored with the preacher. Be enamored with the Word. Be enamored with the Savior of the Word. Amen? Guys, I, I told you this before, and I mean every word of it. I would go to Mud Hut Baptist Church, monotone preacher who preached the Word of God correctly, then a church that had all the bells and whistles, a guy that had a great, charismatic, high energy, uh, could shuck the corn, as they like to say, and be wrong about God's Word. Amen? Boy. So, notice what he says. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech, nor of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the, of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Wow. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perishing, or are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the prince of this world that comes to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And then that's when he gets into, it's God that gives you wisdom. It's God that gives you the interpretation. It's God, the Bible is God discerned as you continue in that scripture. So, you know, that's where, you know, you get a lot of guys that, that get into, I, I don't know, there's a lot of showboat, showboating that goes on sometimes in pulpits. And, uh, you know, and God really honestly is putrid. You know, the, the reality is, Lord, I want you to touch me. I want your hand to be upon me. I want people to see you when I preach. I want people to see you when I teach. I want people to see you when I'm in my living room witnessing to my dad or my, my kid or whatever it may be. Lord, I want to see you. Amen. I, I stepped in one pulpit one time. I don't know where it was at, but it says, Sir, may we see Jesus. Well, I love that. Amen. Sir, may we see Jesus. You're not here to show off. You're not here to do any of those things. You're here to preach the word of God and pray that God's power is on it. Amen. Amen. All right. So we pray. He's the author of it. And remember what I told you? You're reading somebody else's mail. A lost person that reads God's word is reading somebody else's mail. So if you were to read my mail and I were to read your mail, not knowing who it was from, we would probably get all kinds of interpretations, wouldn't we? Boy. Yes, indeed. So keep that in mind. So here we go. Number two. Determine. Determine the situation of whatever text you're in, whatever character you're, you're looking at, whatever Bible character, whatever subject, whatever, whatever book you find yourself in. Determine the situation by answering these questions. All right? All right. Well, first of all, whatever book I'm in, i got to realize that it's also connected to 65 other books. Right? So whatever I'm going to read, if my interpretation contradicts any other part of God's Word in any shape, form, or fashion, then my interpretation is not correct. Are you with me? All right, so you've got to think about, hey, whatever, whatever subject, whatever scripture I'm in, I've got to think about context. I've got to think about the whole entire Bible itself, first and foremost. Is what being taught, is what I'm thinking that this means, does it, does it go against any other part of the Bible? All right? And then you got book. And then you got chapter. All right, so here's a good thing to know. Who wrote it? Who wrote it? Well, what's the author? Well, let me ask you a question. Who wrote the book of Romans? Oh. Did he really? <laughs> Did he really write it? <laughs> well, Paul actually used a scribe to write the book of Romans. You can read that in there. Yes, indeed, he did. Remember how some people think he had a problem with his eyes? And so, it pays to know who wrote it. We do the best we can to find out who wrote it because, you know, they have personalities. God used them, right? 
All right, so you say, well, who wrote it? All right, well, that'll help us. Like, you know, Luke, what would that what would that indicate to you if you knew that Luke wrote a book? What would you think about? He's a what? He was a what? All right, so how does a doctor think? God's going to use that kind of thinking, even though it's all of his word. So you, so you look at the personality, you look at who wrote it. All right. Uh, when was it written? When was it written? All right. When was it written? Why was it written? Why, why would God want to say what he's saying to these people? At this time, what was going on? All right? So, uh, who wrote it? When was it written? Why was it written? And what's the main theme or what's the main idea? What's the main idea that God's trying to get across? Hmm. The main idea that God's trying to get across. Let me see here if I can, my memory serves me well. Let me see if I can show you uh, something here. If I can remember. Let me see here. My memory is very fragile. <laughs> yes, indeed. Let's see. Um, <laughs> all right, so go, go in your Bible to First Peter. Go in your Bible to First Peter. All right, so who wrote it? Well, you know, he's got his name on it. We look at those things, Peter. All right? Think about Peter's life. You think about who he is. You think about how he's grown. You see how the Lord's changing his life. So who wrote it? When was it written? You know, what What was the year? What was going on? Where was the place that it was written? You know, and we're going to get into all these gaps. So I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. All right. What's the main thing? What's the idea? You know, why did God write this book to the people that he wrote it to? What, what is the main idea overall of this whole book? All right. So what's the whole main idea of the book of Peter? All right. Well, um. Somebody might turn over there to First Peter and read in verse 1, because most people kind of set this stage or put the idea, hey, this is why I'm writing to you. This is the reason why I'm writing to you. And a lot of times it's at the beginning of an epistle or the beginning of a book. You know, and they might get down there to verse 3, well, blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To the inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, that fate is not away, reserved in heaven for you. So, God was writing this book to give us a, a lively hope. Somebody might say that. Well, is that why he wrote the book? To give us a lively hope? So, you got to study. you got to read. you got to go. Go in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. All right, go down there to... Uh, uh, verse 10. It says, But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after that you have suffered a while, will make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Sylvanius, a faithful brother unto you, I suppose, listen, I suppose, I have written briefly, <laughs> exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. So he tells us exactly why he wrote this epistle. This, everything that's before that word this, chapter 4, chapter 3, chapter 2, chapter 1, he says right there, I wrote to you briefly, testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. And so these people were going through a tremendous amount of persecution and suffering, and so he was teaching them how to get through that, how to respond to that, how to get through it in a way that was pleasing to the Lord, how to stand in His grace, how to grow in His grace. So we don't know why the book of Peter was written until we get to chapter 5. Now there's other epistles where they come right out in chapter 1 and tell you why it was written. So you, you, when you interpret the Bible, you want to know the main theme of that book, the main idea of that book, and then you can build around that. Are you with me? All right. All right, all right. All right, so then you can do this. Reading the book, read it. Reading the passage and rereading it again and again. And then number three, finding the main idea. So those blanks there where it says you can do this by reading the book. How do I find the main idea? By reading the book, the whole book. Number two, reading the passage and rereading it again and again. 
And then number three, finding the main idea. Everything is built around the main idea. If, I, you know, if it's a long book, then you can go to a conservative commentary. And a lot of times they'll help you get to the point much quicker. Scholars who have taken hours and hours to research and do these things that are conservative, that are saved, that are solid in their teaching, a good conservative commentary will help you speed up that process as well. And they'll point these things out. First uh, John. There's several reasons found throughout First John. In fact, in First John, he tells us five reasons why he wrote that book. Five of them. Boy, yes indeed. Um, write down questions that you're having about the passage. Uh, you know, record other or record or reference other scriptures relating to that passage that you're studying. Remember, scripture interprets scriptures. The best interpreter of scripture is what? Scripture. scripture. I'll look at verse. Look at number five there. Read the passage several times, remembering to understand the context. And guys, remember this. Remember, remember, no matter what you're studying, what character, what subject in the Bible, context is always king. Why do I say that? All right, let me, let me throw this out to you. If I say the word trunk, tell me what comes to your mind randomly. Elephant, Elephant all right. Elephant trunk. Anybody else? Car. Car trunk. <laughs> Treasure trunk. Like a trunk that you have in your hand for putting stuff in. Right, well, what, what kind of trunk is Brother Dave talking about? If I just say trunk, then it's up to what? All kinds of stuff can come out of that. Car trunk, elephant. But if I say elephant trunk, then everybody knows that I'm talking about a what? An elephant. So that's the context. Are you with me? So a lot of people will take stuff out of context. You've heard that? Well, he's taking that out of context. He's taking that out of context. And they're turning it into something. Now, the news media, they're famous for that. They'll take a little blip that somebody says, pull that out, and just let everybody hear that 500 times, not, not letting people hear what he said before it and letting hear what he, people said after it. So that's why when you read the Bible, like an epistle in the New Testament, start at the beginning and read all the way through it. If you start in the middle of an epistle, you're going to get a what? A different meaning. If my wife writes me, let's say, a love letter, and I read the middle of it, and I don't start at the beginning of it, I may completely get a totally different meaning than, than that's intended. So that's why we got to, you know, who wrote it? When was it written? What's the main theme or idea? Read the book. Read the passage. Find the main idea. And typically, God's Word will tell you why, they're, why He's writing that epistle to the people that He wrote it to. And that's how we can begin to properly apply it to our life as well. Um, all right, so uh, note key words, themes, people, character, events, and places. And then, I, you know, number seven there says outline the passage. Well, you know, that, this was like I was teaching uh, a bunch of teachers this. And I got into a lot more. But let me, I'm going to close with number, number nine. But number eight says draw from other resources to further your understanding of the passage. But before you pick up a commentary or different things like that, read the Bible, read that passage itself, read that book itself first. You read it, you pray, you ask God to show you and reveal things to you. And then, you know, as you read that book, get a good understanding of it, then, you know, you can pick up a commentary. Hey, you know, Lord, I'm, I'm struggling here to find out. I want to make sure I'm right. So get a good conservative commentary that'll help you. Like, you know, like John MacArthur. Now, I don't agree with everything that he says, but, but mostly I do. You know, he's a really solid guy. But he'll give you, like, a lot of the history and a lot of the facts and, and a lot of the main ideas and thrust of the uh, way that book was written. And I've also studied it just because he said it. Okay, well, that's great. He said it. So this is what he's saying. Well, let me research it myself to make sure that it's correct. And everything that I've seen so far about like what he says this book was written for, this book was written for, man, he's really right on the money. Uh, I haven't found anything contradictory yet when it comes to those things. So you guys got some good commentary. You know, Phillips, that's another good commentary. Uh, you've got um, Warren Wearsby. He's, he's, a, he's, he's a good commentary that you can read also to help you with the text, to help you with the book, to help you with the Bible character or whatever subject that you're talking about as well. Um, all right, so let's get to number nine. Now, seek ways to apply the scripture. So first of all, we're going to observe it. That means we're going to read it. We're looking. Uh, we're going to reread it. We're going to find out what the main idea is. What's the main point? What is, what is the Lord 
saying, why did he write this book to these people at this time, at this present place? And, and, uh, and then, then after we do that, we observe it, we interpret it, then we apply it. Then we apply it. Now there's a lot of preachers that are awesome at application, but they're very poor in interpretation. That doesn't help you. That's the struggle of every pastor. That's the struggle of every Bible teacher there is. Some are very strong in interpretation, but boy, they're kind of weak in application. And then there's some that are great in application, but they're, they're weak in interpretation. But if you're going to be weak out of the two, don't be weak in interpretation. Amen? Don't be weak in the foundation. You want that to be strong and solid. All right, look at number nine. Seek ways to apply the scripture by asking these questions as you study. All right, so what do you do, Brother Dave? All right, so when you come to the passage, you're looking at it, here's some questions that you want to answer yourself or ask yourself. Are there examples to follow? Is there somebody in there that's a great example? Now, is Judas a good example to follow? No, he's not. Uh, well, hey, well, there's Matthew, and there's Peter, and there's you know Andrew. Are those guys pretty good examples maybe to follow? Some of the things they did? Yeah. So are there examples that God wants you to follow? The Bible says that you know this book was, the Old Testament was written for our learning, right? For our admonishment, for our correction. But also, it says also meant to encourage us as well. So, are there examples to follow? Letter B. Are there commands to obey? Are there commands to obey? Is God telling me in this passage that there's anything that he wants me to obey? Are there commands to obey? Letter C. Are there errors to avoid? You know, what, what is it that the Lord, is there any errors that I need to avoid that God is teaching me from this passage of Scripture? Are there errors to avoid? Now, this is application. This is how you take God's Word after you know the meaning of it and apply it to yourself. All right? Uh, letter D. Are there sins to forsake? Are there sins to forsake? Letter E. Are there promises to claim? You know, if God promised me something, is this a promise that God is telling me, hey, if I do this, he'll do this? Uh, for example, 1 John 1, 9. If, that word in the Greek means a condition. He doesn't put a chain on you and make you confess your sin. If we confess our sins, that means plainly, it means purely, it means personally. If we confess our sins, say the same thing that God says about it, and we're willing to turn from it, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now that's talking about our fellowship, not our relationship, our fellowship. Have you ever noticed that the Word of God never says from Genesis to the book of Revelation? Nowhere in Scripture... Does it say you have to confess your sins to be saved? Now you have to admit and realize and understand you're a sinner. But does he say confess every one of your sins and then I'll forgive you to be saved? No, he doesn't. What does the Bible say? Believe. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in the Lord. Turn from sin. Trust in him. Trust in what he did for you. Because number one, humanly, it would be impossible for you to know every single thing you've ever done. Because the Bible says that we can't judge ourselves. And when I do judge myself, that doesn't justify me before God because he's the only one that can truly judge you thoroughly. Amen? So we confess our sins to maintain our fellowship, never our relationship. So when somebody tells you to go into a booth and confess your sins to a sinful man and that if you do this, you're, you're, you're going to be saved, no, you're not. No, you're not. Because there's one mediator between man and God, and that's the man. And it doesn't say the Pope. Doesn't say the priest, doesn't say the preacher, doesn't say the evangelist, doesn't say the teacher. It says Jesus Christ. He's the one who saves. Amen. And he's the only one who saves. He's the only one that can absolve, quote unquote, your sins. Remember what? When Jesus knew what they were thinking and Jesus looked at the man who was paralyzed, what did he tell him? Your sins are. And the person that was sitting by said what? This man does what? He blasphemes. Only God can forgive sins. So if you get some guy telling you in a collar that he can forgive your sins, he's lying. Period. Man cannot forgive you of your sins. And, and to prove it, Jesus said, all right, I'll tell you what. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or take up your pallet and walk? Well, which would have been easier? It would have been easier for Jesus to say your sins are forgiven. Anyone could say that. 
But hey, but hey, here's a guy that was born that way from birth. Hey, get up and walk and take your path at home. Now that proved to them that he was divine and that he said, and that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins because I'm God in the flesh. Period. Amen. Amen. All right. F, are there new thoughts about God? Is there anything different that I'm learning about God in this passage of Scripture that I didn't know before? Letter G, are there principles to live by? Are there principles found in this text of Scripture to live by? Now, guys, this is not exhaustive, but this is to give you an idea. Are there examples to obey? Are there commands to uh, obey? Are there errors to avoid? Are there sins to forsake? Are there promises to claim? Are there new thoughts about God? Are there principles to live by? So these are some of the questions that you can ask yourself to help you apply the scripture. But to help you interpret the scripture, who wrote this book? When was it written? Who was it written to? What was going on? Those kind of things. And we're going to talk about that and we're going to get into all these uh, practical applications. And I'm going to teach you and show you how people can go way astray when it comes to interpreting the Bible. When you come to it with a deductive mindset, and you come to the Bible with your 21st century idea, and you look at the text of Scripture that way, boy, people come up with all kinds of crazy doctrines that you don't need to be a part of. We've got to take these off and put whatever century it was written in and put those lenses on and begin to look at what's going on and to look at the people that it was written to, where these people were, the place that it was, what was going on, was there any significant thing at that time going on? Uh... And we'll see that as we look at it this next Wednesday. So, special note, problem or problems faced in Bible interpretation is what we're going to start with on next Wednesday. And, uh, and we're going to get into that. And you'll notice there where it says that, special note, problems faced in Bible interpretation. Do, do you see number one, number two, number three? Do, do you see where it says gap, the gap, the gap, right? Well, these are all the gaps, and it goes all the way, if you turn all the way to number six. So there's six major gaps that you and I need to understand and know before we can properly interpret the Bible and apply it to our lives. And I want to show you what those are and um, show you how people could go astray and show you also how to get to the right interpretation with these things. And um, you'll notice where it says chronological and historical, and then it says gap. I'll give you the first one. The first one is the time gap, the time gap, all right? Why is that important to know, the time gap? And we'll talk about that next Wednesday. But as of right now, are there any questions at all? And I'll be honest, you're not going to hurt my feelings. I want you to be completely honest. Has this helped you at all today? Okay, that's my, it's my desire that you are helped. And if, if you're confused about anything, please, please come see me. And I will sit down with you and I'll walk you through whatever I need to walk you through to help you understand what we're, we're saying better but a lot of times guys when it comes to you know bible study when it comes to your your teacher you know i hope we also do this will help you pray for the evangelist that comes it'll help you pray for your pastor it'll help you pray for your sunday school teacher because there's a lot that he's got to do there's a lot of preparation that goes into these like you know my messages are anywhere from eight to twelve hours of preparation that's not counting prayer and everything else that goes into it so, you know, so pray for us that, you know, God will use us to be a blessing and a benefit to his people. That's the greatest thing that a, a pastor could be rewarded with is that people get it, people see it, people's lives are being changed, people are being saved. That's the greatest compliment that any pastor could ever have is that God's using him and that people are really getting it. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Brother, uh, let's see, Brad, will you close us in prayer, Brother?